if you are in the East Coast of the United States or the Central. Good evening if you are in Iceland or Europe or the Middle East, Oman perhaps. Uh, good overnight if you're in Asia, India. Good morning, Australia, Hawaii. And good morning in Seattle to Christina Skeppelman, the general director of the Seattle Opera, who I've known for a lot of years and very happily have known her. And Christina, welcome. Good very morning, Fred. Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Sure. What I would like to do, I always start with my guests to talk about things of interest to them, but I've had a question for a German person that I realized that in all my, it's now 44 years that I've lived in Germany, visited Germany, worked in Germany. And this is an answer I should know, but I just don't. Namely, what is the educational system like in Germany in terms of music for very young people, for young people, for high school people, and then perhaps beyond? But I've always wondered the basic foundation of a music education for a typical German. Look, I can only tell you the typical German of my generation. Uh, I left Germany 33 years ago and have not lived in Germany in 33 years. I can tell you that when I grew up in elementary school, we were offered, uh, we had music classes three times a week. Uh, singing and just basic music. We were offered free recorder classes by the city youth uh, conservatory through the school. I went to a music high school uh, afterwards and had five times a week music classes. We had to sing in a chorus. We had to play in the class orchestra, school orchestra. So my musical school education was, I think, more intense than on average because not everybody had this type of education. So it's a special school in Hamburg that has an make has still today uh, an emphasis on music. I'm afraid that um, even in Germany, the, the arts and music education has is a little less intense than it was 40 years ago. Um, now I'm giving my age away, but most, most of my friends know anyway how old I am. But I, I do think that even in Germany, it's not the way it used to be. And I think this is a problem. I think arts education and music should be part of general education. I think it's part of the formation of a person, of a thinking, of, of the brain. And it makes you a better professional, no matter what you do afterwards. But So I... As far as I'm concerned, I enjoyed a rather intense musical education in school and then also sang in the children's chorus at the opera in, in, in Hamburg. But I'm not sure if it's the same for everybody. By contrast, in New York, when I was a child, I'm 64, um, kindergarten teachers, and that's a good German word, kindergarten teachers had to know how to play the piano. And there was a wow. piano in every classroom in New York City at that time yeah. in kindergarten. And we would gather around the piano. And I remember my teacher, these teachers always make an impression, even though I was four or five. Her name was Miss Nafee. And Miss Nafee played two pieces on the piano, one by Brahms that I could still sing if I could sing and the other by Francis Poulenc. And when I think now that in the early 1960s that a teacher in a public school in Brooklyn in New York City was playing Brahms and Poulenc for five-year-olds and we were all taught to sing, we were all given musical instruments. I, long, long story short, but my uh, family member did not want me to play the violin thinking that I should have a different instrument. I was given the clarinet, but there was no clarinet teacher. Yes. I played the violin. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a good start. I mean, we can, and I know that your musical selections that you gave us include the violin, and I want to ask you about that. But I then want, went on to the singing side, and I was in the New York City Children's Chorus. And New York, as you well know, 
has Carnegie Hall. I had Clive Gillinson, who was the head of Carnegie Hall, on with me in May, in June. And Carnegie Hall is very beautiful, but also very welcoming. And all New Yorkers tend to go there. And many of us have played, sung, spoken on that stage. And I sang a solo when I was about 11 by Edvard Grieg. And it links you to that forever. We too have a music high school. It's called uh, LaGuardia High School here in New York. It used to be known as the High School of Music and Art and many of our famous musicians went there. I got in for singing. My teacher was Herman Pry, but my musician father panicked that the last thing he wanted was that I have a career in music <laughs> because <laughs> it's so unsteady. So I went to a science high school actually and sang in school performances there and then returned to working in opera almost immediately after high school. But it gave me the foundation. It gave me the awareness. We had at that time Leonard Bernstein who taught the young people's concerts and classes. There were 53 of them. And I went to many. And I'm not saying I'm special. I'm typical is what I'm saying. But we don't have that degree of music education today in the schools. A number of years ago, I was working in Norway, in the far north of Norway, and in the Arctic, where the Fisher people are. And it's not an area known for opera. But I went into a church one Sunday just to hear the uh, congregation. And I discovered that every Norwegian, from a tiny child to an old person, could read music and could sight sing. And that struck me as very impressive that a whole nation can sight sing. And frankly, I would love to see this as a national goal that we can all read music, whatever nation we're in. I think that would have a great unifying effect in our world in ways that all the foreign policy and diplomacy and fine statements cannot achieve. Because if we hear someone singing or playing and we can read along, that connects us in a much larger scale. So connects us emotionally, Fred, because you don't necessarily, I mean, I agree with you, it, we sh it would be wonderful that everybody could read music, but everybody can hear and feel music. And there is a connecting factor just by the, by, by the um, emotional impact that it has, because it will, music will, in, in an emotionally healthy person, let's put it like this, mm -hmm. stimulate the same emotions or the same joy or sadness or melancholy. It, and it's not a matter of your language or your cultural background. There's something that does connect us. And music is a universal language. It is indeed. I'll, I was not going to get into your list right away of some of the musical selections you made, which listeners can find on Adagio on this page. But I last night began to listen to some Bach. Now that may sound pretty normal, but Bach is not necessarily my favorite composer. Not to say that I dislike him, I, I, he's magnificent, but he's not the one that goes deepest to my heart for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. However, I listened to the solo sonatas and partitas for violin played by Yeh Yehudi Menuhin that you mentioned. And wow, did that go very, very, very deep. What is it about these pieces, and maybe this performance on the violin that you studied that particularly affected you and made you mention this piece, these pieces? I, uh, first of all, I love Bach. I mean, it's, it's, it's what I love to listen to on a Sunday morning when it's still quiet and that, that perfection, that, that beautiful perfection that on the surface could seem simple, but is so deep and so um, emotional. And so from Bach's, um, I dare to say, emotional point of view and intellectual point of view, so spiritual also. And that perfection I find so soothing. I mean, there's the, the beauty of it. And then th there is no mistake. It, it, every note is there because it has to be there. And I find this so relaxing because you don't, 
worry about where is it going. And I, I enjoy that simplicity that is though anything but simple. And I've, I've always enjoyed uh, Bach and especially the, the solo partitas. I mean, I love his choral works, but of course they are so complex and so uh, magnificent. They, they really are uh, overwhelming if you truly listen to it. And I've sung some, but uh, in the chorus, mind you. And um, these solo partitas to me uh, are the perfect way to start a day in, in harmony and in beauty. Are you a morning person? Um, I wish they could be both. I like, you know, I live too many, I mean, in this business, you go just to sleep really, really late. But I recently had to get up a few times at 5.30 in the morning. And it reminded me how much I like the mornings. When I do get up in the morning, I, I, I am a morning person. When I manage to go to bed early, <laughs> I love being a morning person. And here the other day, I saw um, Mount Rainier with the with one side beautifully pink from the rising sun, and oh boy, that made it worth getting up at five thirty in the morning. I'm often up at five thirty, but I haven't gone to bed yet. I'm very much a night <laughs> owl, and I, I mention that because this music I listen to not in the morning glow, but deep in the night when it was completely dark out even in New York City. And it had a very different feeling of just me and the violin mm -hmm. in a darkish room. And that was very meditative in a different way, but it was not about beginnings, which is in a way what you described, but endings. And in a good way, I went to bed, I yeah. slept yeah. well, I woke up, I'm talking to you, but, um, it's interesting how that serves. It made me think of something else. I happen to adore the music of India mm -hmm. and have always wondered about how that whole world of Indian classical music existed outside of so-called Western classical music and is magnificent. It's a thing unto itself. And one form of Indian music is the raga and they have yep. morning ragas and afternoon ragas and evening ragas and how this music of different times of the day suits the mood and gives an energy and gives a meditative feeling. Yep. And I often, if I'm taking a break from Western classical, from opera, from gospel music or American popular song, will put on some music of India and it's just, that really takes you places. Um, I wanted to pick up on something you said about Bach. You said that in effect that you always have an insecurity about where he's going and you don't wonder where he might go. It triggered a thought in my head when I teach the fundamentals of classical music and opera, but especially classical music, I often use visual artists to give a parallel because sometimes people are more visual yeah. and the big three that I always start with are Bach, Mozart and Beethoven. And I say that if you like Leonardo da Vinci, you like Bach. Yes. If you like Mo Raphael, you like Mozart. And if you like Beethoven, you like Michelangelo or the other way around. And what I meant by that is that in the briefest terms, Michelangelo and Beethoven have a raging utopian feeling about them. Uh, Bach and Leonardo have this wide ranging genius and this magnificence of the brain and of the ideas, whereas there's spirituality. A, a great and spirituality, yes. And there's a graciousness and a, and a equipoise to use a fancy English word about Raphael and Mozart, but with Mozart, we don't always know where he's going. It's like Ella Fitzgerald, that they will go off on a tangent and will think, where are they going? But then you realize, of course they're right. They are sure. the geniuses and we just are here to follow along. But I think that I like the mystery of where are they going 
rather than the security of this is inevitably what Bach will give us. Tell the mystery is know. great, Fred. I would agree with you. Mystery is part also of what, what is so enjoyable because if everything is predictable, it'll be a little boring also. And I'm not somebody who likes boring or likes predictable and, and, and routine. But there are moments of, of um, mental peacefulness that I think that certainty adds to the peace and that ability to relax. And, you know, the mystery can have this effect too, but I, I, I sometimes prefer the certainty. Maybe that's the German in me, which not all aspects of me are German, so. Well, I, I have a lot of German in me too. I don't have any German background specifically, but I really connect in Germany and Austria, each country. Uh, Italy, certainly, I think you and I have that in common. Spain, part of the, the wonder of living in a world is, at least from my view, that we are entirely equal. We are all human beings with equal rights that we should have and equal potentials. But we're all a little different. And that's very nice because we learn from those differences. Just seeing, for example, in Norway, everyone could read music triggered an idea in my head that I had never thought about before. But I mean, we are all different, it's true, but also there's an Italian saying, il mondo è bello perché vario. Mm -hmm. I mean, th that's the beauty of it, that we are so different, but yeah. there is an essence of us that is very um, similar. And also every place you go, I mean, I lived in five countries in eight different cities, and I guarantee you, there's no ideal place. Every place has positive sides, negative sides, things that you personally like more or less, but every place has wonderful things. And that's what ultimately unites every place that they are enjoyable and fascinating and intelligent and interesting things in every place. I often say that it is the lucky person who is born where she or he was intended to live and be born. An almost as lucky person is the one who is able to go to be in and perhaps live in the place where she or he was intended to be. And a less lucky person is the one who just never finds that place. Yeah. Uh, I, for me, it's Italy. I'm a New Yorker. I adore New York. I'm very much a New Yorker. But I've always said to people that they don't really know me until they've been with me in Italy. The national conversation is different. It's not just mm -hmm. the things we think of for Italy, like the food and the fashion and the opera and so on. It's about the human relations. And I have profound friendships in Italy that have spanned for many, many decades. And the quality of friendship when you have a friend in Italy is something very special. And I know you've spent a lot of time in Italy and tell me. Yeah, I, I lived four years in Milan and several months in Venice. And that was at the very beginning of me working in this business. I was 22 when I moved from Hamburg to Milan, uh, blue eyed and bushy tailed. And, uh, and, um, and I still, some of my best friends are there. Um, I'm, I'm going there in a couple of weeks. And they're great and wonderful friends, as you say. They're lasting friendships and they're quality friendships, even if you don't see each other often or maybe once every two or three years, it, it doesn't matter. But those are the real friends. It's not the, the quantity of times you see each other, but the quality that counts. And, uh, and I love Italy. I'm not sure I want to work again in Italy, but <laughs> I could certainly live again in Italy. I love the people. I love the food. I love the beauty of the landscape, no matter where you go, north, south, center. And uh, there's so much about Italy that is truly, truly wonderful. I mean, they, they are very lucky. I realized you just triggered a memory. I was supposed to be working in Milan tonight at a performance of Viaggio Arems by Rossini at La Scala. And wow. I, you know, Facebook allows you to see your past. And I was in Milan a, a year ago tonight and I got a haircut and had a good meal. I have a good barber in Milan. It's the same place where Puccini got his haircut and his beard done. And Daniel Barenboim goes there. Uh, and I was in Ireland three years ago 
planning to work at the Wexford Festival and um, but I want to defend something about Italy, not that it, sh it needs defense, but one thing you said about working there, I get what you mean. I, it's difficult sometimes to work. It's in exhausting. Italy. It is I mean, exhausting. It's fascinating, but it's exhausting. But again, to me, Italy is my teacher, my main teacher. And they have in Italy something called l'arte di arrangiarsi, the art of making things happen. Uh, I was fortunate to work for with Franco Zeffirelli and then Giorgio Streller. And Zeffirelli was the one who really taught me about if you're handed a problem, think through to the solution rather than lament the problem. Yeah. And in America, we say if you're handed lemons, make lemonade, but it's more complex than that. And yes. there's something in the Italian mindset that I really admire about problem solving, about spontaneity. They have a word in Italian that I love, estro, E-S-T-R-O, which yeah. is really sort of a creative surge at the moment yeah. you need it. And They're the best improvisers yeah. in the world. Yeah. They will... They, maybe you can argue that they're not the, be the best planners, although then on the other hand, they have great engineering also that takes yeah. planning. I mean, look at Ferrari, Ducati, and, uh, and Lamborghini and those type of things. You can you cannot improvise them, but throw any problem at them, as you say, and they will, they will find a solution instead of being paralyzed, which in many places people just go, oh my God, we've never done it this way. We've always done it that way. And and don't know how to face the issues. Like, move on, find, yeah. use your experience, use your knowledge, and find a solution. And that is, I think, a great, great asset of the Italian spirit and character. I, I would agree with you. You mentioned that you lived in Venice for a while. What were you doing in Venice? I was the assistant to the artistic director at La Fenice, uh, which was at the time Mario Messinis, who sadly just passed away. Wow. Mario was fabulous. I worked with him when I worked at the artist management in Milan. He was the artistic director of Rai Milano, and I worked a lot with him in 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 the programming of the concerts of of Rai Milano and and the artists that uh, that we that he selected ultimately. But we worked a lot together there, and then he took me to Venice. Uh, but after, it was a complicated political situation, like always yeah, in, in sure. Italy. So it only was a short period, but it was it was a fascinating short period. And uh, as much as I don't want to live in Venice again because it's too it is too many tourists, it's it's a little island with you know a questionable mentality. But oh my God, the beauty of that city. I mean, when I at night sometimes walked on my way to my apartment across Piazza San Marco at one in the morning in this complete silence, looking at this perfect architecture, that was a privilege. It really was. I don't know if you know, I was a Venetian, Venetian history major in college. Oh, gee. <laughs> the reason being that I had the plan to work in opera and opera, though born in Florence, really took root in Venice. Mm -hmm. And your native city of Hamburg and Venice have a lot in common in that they were the first cities in the two major opera countries, Italy and Germany, mm -hmm. to have public opera houses. Yeah. And I believe in Hamburg it was 1678. And in Venice, it was much earlier in the same century in the 1600s. But the idea that a middle-class public could purchase a ticket and go into an opera house and see a performance meant that it was not about a royal court as in Paris or in Vienna or other places, but it was a public art form. Correct. No, that is true. That I mean, correct as far as Hamburg also is concerned. It's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah. So you have had, and you continue to have, an interesting, to put it mildly, career in that a very dear friend of mine uses a term that applies to you. She says, she has been washed with all the waters of the world. <laughs> Pretty much. And I think, 
you practically have as well. And you have worked in opera houses, how many you said in five countries, how many? Eight cities, five countries, three continents. Three continents, okay. The one that I really want to start with is the one that to me is the most unusual. You were the first director general of the Royal Opera House in Muscat in Oman. Yeah. Now, not everybody could immediately summon on the map where Oman is. Would you describe it? Um, it's on the Arab Peninsula on the um, southeastern tip, right underneath the United Arab Emirates, who until, by the way, 71, 72 were part of Oman. Uh, so it's south of, uh, of the UAE and east of Yemen, and also south, obviously, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, part of the And peninsula. Iran and Iraq are in the neighborhood. And Iran is across. Actually, I went to Iran while I lived there. Yeah. It's, it's just an hour and a half flight from Muscat to Tehran. Um, uh, also, India is pretty much sort of a cross, I would call it. <laughs> and uh, it was the best time of my life. It was fascinating. I still Why? go back once a year to visit. Why was that the best time of your life? Gorgeous Opera House, fantastic acoustic that, uh, I mean, Joshua Bell and Claudia Bardo actually said the acoustic is phenomenal, so you don't have to take my word for it. Um, the beauty of that house is stunning. Uh, and every morning walking from the parking garage over to, to the building. And I thought, wow, and I work here. I mean, it's, it was really fascinating. The people are uh, very kind, very polite and very respectful. Um, the, the sea is gorgeous. I mean, the beaches are stunning and wonderful snorkeling and, and diving waters. And it was, it was just fascinating. I mean, it's not everybody's cup of tea. I love anything that is different. I'm curious. I want to get to know what is different because, you know, life is short. The world is big. Might as well see a lot of it. And so being able to live and work in a, in a different culture, to, the different that was to me different, was such a pleasure and such a learning experience also. And and I just enjoyed it. it. It was, I had wonderful colleagues, mainly Omani, of course, but also a lot of expats. You know, they had never been a theater in, in that part of the world. So just to, to run the theater, run the stage, the, the functionality of the theater is, was new to them. I mean, it's you know, it like you and me trying to figure out how an oil rig works. Uh, we, <laughs> we wouldn't know where to start. So, of course, there were experts and professionals from, from other countries, but we worked a lot with uh, made the administration, of course, was Omani. The language is Arabic. Uh, the business language for, for us experts was English, obviously. And, and I also worked and connected with some of the technical universities in order to get first interns to the stage in order for, for to get give formation to people in Oman, because the idea always was to at some point have Omanis actually work and, and run the opera house, but it doesn't happen overnight. And that kind of spirit of adventure and of startup was just really fabulous. I, I still have good connections with some of my colleagues then, with uh, the Omani colleagues, with some of the expats that are still there. And it was just fascinating, except the temperature in the summer gets a little hot. I remember one summer we had two weeks, 52 degrees Celsius, uh. <laughs> and at night, maybe 45 degrees. I mean, that was hard, but even there, you get used to it. You yeah. move slower, you drink more water, and yeah. you just enjoy the wonderful sunsets and uh, and the some friends of mine asked me, didn't wasn't it didn't it wake you up the call to prayer? early in the morning. I have to say, when I moved away from Oman, I missed that <laughs> call to prayer in the distance that that has this, to talk about music, it has a, you know, it has a little mel sure. melody, it's a sing song. And I, no, I just love living there. Small board. Um, yeah. And uh, my boss was the, um, the minister of higher education, a 
fabulously intelligent woman uh, that uh, still is the um, the minister of higher education, and it, it was fascinating. It was just fascinating. So that leads me to a couple of more questions. The first you just hinted at being a woman in that society. If if the head of education is a woman and and hired you as a woman. Were there challenges? Maybe you were awakened to things that were more open than what you expected about being a woman working in that society. Somebody tell me that it's easy to work as a woman here in the United States or in Western cultures. I argue that, uh, first of all. And second, no, I, 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 there was a very polite atmosphere there are many women in very important positions in in various Arab countries. I mean, you also you cannot do a cookie cutter approach. You know, the Muslim world goes from Morocco all the way far into the east to Indonesia, yeah. And and they those those are differences from from village to village in Oman. There are differences, so you can't really say it's all the same. And I had many extremely competent women also. I had to hire a lot of people in, in, while I was there. A lot of great, very educated women. Many, you're gonna, you should check, you should look actually, if you don't believe it, but many diplomats, uh, consul generals and ambassadors of the Arab countries of that um, Gulf area are women. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, and uh, I mean, there was, as an example, the Omani ambassador to the United States is a woman, the Iraqi ambassador to Oman, a woman. And you see a lot in the diplomatic world, women, and you see in many important positions, women. We, we, um, which doesn't mean that everything is perfect. I'm not trying to you know, make somebody believe that all you know, women rule. That's not true, but it's not mm-hmm. true in our world either. No. But I do think we sometimes have to get beyond the stereotype and, uh, you know, we hear something and I, I even, I mean, I was often asked, oh, could you drive? I go, excuse me, Saudi Arabia is not the entire Arab world. I mean, could we please distinguish that there is a difference? I mean, New York is not the United States. No. So we have to differentiate and, um, and uh, the, the obligation to wear the hijab uh, uh, headscarf is in Saudi Arabia and in Iran. And... Um, and that's it. And mm-hmm. the, of course, if you are from there and if your cultural environment, that's what you grow up, that's what you wear. When I went to Iran, I did wear a scarf because that, that's the law there. If you don't like it, you don't have to go. I mean, nobody forced me to go. I was happy to go. I went to Tehran and Esfahan. It was fascinating. Mm. And, uh, and it was February and it was raining. So wearing a scarf was actually useful. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it didn't bother me at all. And if it had bothered me, I would not have gone there. And one of my um, colleagues at the in, in Muscat, when um, I asked once, it was extremely hot one day. And so I said, isn't this hot to wear this? She goes, no, it's very light fabric. It actually is very airy to wear these um, garments, those long, wavy um clothes that the men wear, by the way, too. I mean, the mandate to wear what to wear what they wear goes for men and women. It just looks different. But mm-hmm. the men also are have to wear something on their head, either the musar or or the um, or the other cap that they have. The musar is the scarf. Um, but those long garbs actually the, there's ventilation. Air comes through mm-hmm. it. They're much better than when we wear jeans and and in a tight shirt. So and then she also said to me, you know, I, you don't know if I rolled out of bed without washing my hair and if underneath <laughs> I'm still wearing my pajamas. You know, so she actually, that's not why you wear it. But I thought, well, that's actually true. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have to dress up and dress well to look good. Yeah. And there are easier ways to look good. So, you know, what I'm saying is, and some might kind of, find this a little trivial, but um, but what I'm saying is don't take something you hear and generalize for a whole culture. 
um, because that that is not fair and it's not fair to them, to that culture. It's not fair to our culture. You can't generalize in our world and the Western world either. I agree with you. My second question, which is more to my interest based on my background and yours, is it sounds like that was a purpose-built opera house. I've worked in places where they just built a theater, where sometimes I've consulted on the construction of yeah. the stage of the auditorium. And that's a phenomenal undertaking at any time, whether it was done hundreds of years ago, whether recently a boom in Denmark and Norway and in Finland of building new opera houses, occasionally in the United States, such as Dallas, uh, a lot now in China, they're building opera houses. But I suppose my interest is this was being built in a part of the world that to my knowledge didn't have a lot of connection to opera. So- No, and it's not an opera from? house. It is not uh, an opera house. It's a performing arts center. It was okay. supposed to, originally was supposed to be called House of Music and it ended up to be called Royal ha Opera House Mascot, which actually I think sounds very beautiful. And, yeah. um, and the theater is, um, is for opera too. The, the idea was basic, the basic philosophy of that building is to connect cultures, to bring artists from all over the world that they, and they see Oman for a few days, they get exposed to the Omani culture and the Omanis and the experts living in, in Oman uh, get exposed to all these different cultures that come to their country, to their city, to perform various musical styles, because the um, 30, 35 percent of the programming is, is Arabic music and, and mm -hmm. the stars of the Arab countries that 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 they have. I mean, that's another thing that uh, we often believe that if we don't know about it, it can't there can't be anything or it can't be yeah. any good. The huge stars in, in every country, musical stars, singers, groups. Um, dance and, and, and theatrical groups. And uh, that was fascinating for me to experience. And then there is uh, a component of concerts, uh, opera, some ballet, jazz, world music. I mean, it's, it's really a, a great uh, array of various styles, a variety of the international musical world uh, coming to Oman and perform mm -hmm. there. And I know that several opera, I mean, the Vienna State Opera came, Bavarian, Bavarian State Opera and Napoli and uh, Venice. And some came with trepidations because they had no idea what Oman is and where it is. And I yet have to encounter somebody who said that they were not happy with the experience. So that speaks for that theater, but it also speaks for that country because the theater alone cannot make for a good impression. Yeah. And it's a, it's a truly kind and beautiful country. Are there going to be tomorrow opera fans? No, but that wasn't the intention to create opera fans uh, as much as if we were building a theater for no theater in Munich. Mm -hmm. I don't think that within a short time you would create a fan base uh, among um, the the Bavarians for no theater. It's, but it's an exposure to a different type of music and, and event that was mm -hmm. important. And we also, um, and they still do. I mean, at the time we started education events, we worked with schools also. Uh, we brought uh, from Como a magic flute, a reduced magic flute there. I know that work with. Yeah. And yeah. worked with the schools, and it was it was the most touching thing to see little Omani uh, kids singing in Arabic the the Papageno, the Vogelhändler tune. I mean, mm -hmm. it was it was truly touching, and it reminds you that what we said earlier, music is an international language and is a connecting medium, and that was the idea. Because you also 
you know, we always think that we invented it all, which of course we didn't. Um, but, you know, our music and our culture is not the measure of all things. And yep. they have in those countries their own music, their own culture, their own history. And a lot of our history has come to Europe and then further from, from China, from Persia, from Babylonia, from, from Greece, from, from the Roman Empire. We didn't invent it all. And it's, uh, we sometimes need to remind ourselves that it's yeah. not that we go to some, you know, intellectual, musical, cultural desert, just because we don't know anything about that culture, it doesn't mean there is anything. And some, Absolutely. I mean, I've had conversations about this and some people are um, either have preconceived ideas or relatively ignorant, which is fine, you cannot know it all, but then at least be curious, be, be open and, and receptive that there is more than what you know within your, sure. your cultural environment. You also worked in one of my favorite opera houses in the world, uh -oh. the Teatro Liceo in Barcelona. Yeah. I just adore it. And all of us opera lovers, when asked, can usually summon the one performance they went to that was their favorite of all. And I've been to thousands and thousands. But if I had to stick with one, it would have been a performance I saw at the Liceo, I'm guessing 1979, around then. Yeah. It was Andrea Chenier with Montserrat Caballé and Jose Carreras and Juan Pons, all Catalans. And this was at a time when the national government of Spain and Catalonia were coming up with new agreements about how what kind of status Catalonia would have in the greater Spain and whether Catalonia would break away and, and Catalan language was allowed to be used and spoken publicly and the programs printed in Catalan in the theaters. Yeah. And they have had two programs. Yeah. Still today have two programs. Yeah. And I, you know, I knew something about it. I was a very young guy then. And I knew something about Catalonia and Barcelona and so on. But what I experienced apart from Andrea Chenier being one of my favorite operas and Calvi and Carreras being phenomenal. I had worked with him before at La Scala. I'd never heard her. I'd heard her, but I didn't hear her in Catalonia. What struck me was you had Catalan artists in front of a Catalan audience. Viva la morte en siem is the way the opera ends. Yes. I have never heard, and I'm getting goosebumps now as I talk, guns flesh, as I talk yeah. about it. Um, it was just the most spectacular night in the theater. And again, I don't like to generalize, but if I had to pick the best opera audience in the world that I know, it's the one in Barcelona. They're great. Yes. When they really get excited, they the, the house explodes. It's, yeah. Yes, absolutely. And they were very fortunate, of course, that over in, in a specific period of time, they had the best singers of the world for a while. I mean, you mentioned Caballé Carreras, Juan Pons, Sardinero, Aragal. Uh, I mean, Victoria the, the, de Los Angeles. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah. the list is, yeah. I mean, Victoria de Los Angeles was, was incredible. Yeah. You, the list is, it's a nice, large group of incredible singers. And that is also, of course, that that creates excitement. If it's your own, your own singers, your from your own region, from your own city, and but still today, the the audience is amazing. I mean, just uh, really incredible. When I the, uh, I was twice there. I was there from eighty eight. Uh, oh, no, when was I there? Ninety two to ninety four. So I lived through the fire when the when the theater yeah. burned down. And then now when I was there recently, it was the second time uh, for nearly five years. And it was incredible. And the, the audience, when they're excited, it was fantastic. We did Andrea Chenier a uh, year and a half ago, so two years ago, with uh, Kaufman and with Radvanovsky and Carlos Alvarez. And I mean, the house exploded. Yeah. And by the last two performances, 
uh, they, um, Sandra actually did, sang the encore of the Mama Morta. And it's, a, I, I've watched that recording a few times and the reaction of the audience, it's like an explosion and it's so exciting. And also at the very end at the opera, at the curtain calls, the, the warmth and the energy and, and forcefulness with which they applaud and, and shout bravo. And it's, I mean, that Chenier, by the way, was also special. I mean, Kaufmann, Carlos Alvarez, Sonor Banovsky, that was pretty damn good, if I may say this. I can imagine. Well, it brings up a topic that I discuss a lot with colleagues and especially with the public. And I get a lot of pushback from the public on this, not so much from colleagues, please. And is that Seattle coffee by any chance? Um, it is Seattle coffee, yes. Famous homemade Seattle though. Coffee. Oh, good. But okay. <laughs> Seattle beans. Yeah, Seattle roasted beans. Very good. Um, namely, this is not a question of me being older. I'm not old, but I'm older and having gone to opera for many decades and knowing opera and being good at it. But there is a, two things. The level of education, as we discussed earlier, is different about what we're experiencing. And I teach opera everywhere, but there's a second thing. And with all due respect to younger people, we have a wonderful young generation and I'm not dissing them at this juncture, but I find that, at least as regards opera, that they want to feel cool. They are not as passionate. They don't want to be as emotive. It's, it's a commodity in a way, whereas for older generations, and I mean going back at least to Monteverdi, older generations, there's a level of passion. We don't appreciate opera. We love opera. And... Yeah among younger people, it seems that it's more that if it's not trendy, edgy, cool, relevant, whatever that means, that they find nothing to engage with. And I think part of it, and, and you will tell me what you think, is the fact that we've made it very visual, we've made it very about reading, and we've lost track of the fact that the first means of communication in opera is always music and at least to me and the yeah. phenomenon of having a glorious orchestra a magnificent chorus and soloists who sing without amplification we have that direct energy current of Calbier Carreras, Kaufman, Radvanovsky just grabbing us wherever it grabs us and pulling us out of our seats. I don't, I don't sit back at the opera. I'm engaged because there's so much to grab us on so many levels that even beyond then that music, the visuals, the dramatics, the being in the moment, which is something very wonderful when whatever we do, but certainly opera. And the way opera seems to address every issue known to humankind. Am I wrong about audiences or audiences different in different places? I actually, I, I don't think you're entirely wrong, although I do disagree with your analysis of it. I don't think it's the young audience. I think it's the more um, seasoned audience that sometimes stifles the enthusiasm. I mean, I've seen it sometimes when I see young people that, that you know, applaud enthusiastically and they get shushed uh, uh, or or they whisper to each other because it's oh, this is so cool and they get shushed i i look i i also i don't want to go back to past centuries where people were eating walking going in and out and doing other things in their boxes and, and not watching the stage It looks like we may have temporarily lost Christina. So I hope we get her back soon. And in the meantime, I'm going to tell you about some of the people who I have coming up in future weeks, uh, always subject to change. 
But uh, surprise guest next week, September 18th, on September 25th, I have the wonderful Luca Pizzaroni, Luca Pizzaroni being a bass, who's actually will join us from Barcelona when uh, he will be appearing at the opera at the Teatro Luceo. The week after, October 2nd, Americans will know this person. Her name is Lynn Rosetto Casper. She is one of the great food writers, authors, and broadcasters. And we're going to do a special episode about food and opera, specifically Emilia Romagna in Italy. And it will be the uh, foods of Verdi, of Rossini, of Luciano Pavarotti, Morella Freni, Arturo Toscanini, and more. Uh, in addition, a couple of weeks after that, I hope to have Lauren Flanagan, the wonderful soprano, and then Anique Lafarge, who's written a new biography, a new book about Chopin called Chasing Chopin. Then I have, and this is all from memory, October 23rd, the baritone Lucas Meacham, wonderful baritone. Uh, the 30th of October, I have John Cheek. John Cheek being a classic bass uh, singer with a very long and very illustrious career. On November 6th, I have Anthony Yan. Anthony Yan is the house doctor of the Metropolitan Opera. And we will be talking about medical issues and singing and musicians and performances. And he's also a great collector. And there's Christina. The problem is a lawyer. Of I'm all sure. kinds of um, memorabilia about that. So Christina, yeah. while you were away, I told the uh, people who will be joining me in the next month or so and keep staying with Idacho Fred Plotkin on Fridays and you'll find fascinating people, <laughs> including Christina Skeppelman. Welcome back. Uh oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry about this. I, I, I think there's something with our system, but it doesn't matter. Anyway, um, I think that the audience sometimes stifles the enthusiasm of others. I mean, a more mature audience who likes, you know, the silence and let's not applaud in between, let's not bother anybody. And I, I wish we all, any age, first time opera goer or you and I, would just express enthusiasm, applaud. You can ask any singer they want to feel the audience to be alive. And I've asked the question many times. I've had this discussion often. And, you know, I still have one to tell me, no, 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 I don't want the applause. It bothers me. No, they want it. Even if you applaud in the wrong place, there's not going to throw them off. They're professionals. They, they're doing what they're supposed to do. And, but at the same time, they'd like to feel there's an audience. Applaud. Pay attention. Shout bravo, whatever you want. We need this for this art form to be alive. It, I, it's, uh, yeah. I, I, I really want people to, to just be engaged because it's the stage giving to the audience. The audience has to give back to the stage. And that energy makes an exciting performance. And that, frankly, is part of the wonder for me of going to opera in Barcelona. Yeah. I will see anything in Barcelona. I'll see anything almost anywhere, but absolutely in Barcelona <laughs> because of that thrilling experience. Yeah. But they are knowledgeable. Uh, I'm fine yeah. with people who are genuinely moved and enthused to applaud even during the second act of Low and Grin when Wagner Ice will say, shh. But um, nonetheless, I do love different cities and studying how the audiences respond. Yeah. I'm critical of my own city of New York, and I can be because I'm a New Yorker, in that we have very passionate, knowledgeable audiences. We have great cultural diversity here and that we have people from all over the world. But New York is a very large metropolitan area. And almost as soon as the curtain comes down at the Met or some of our other opera companies, you see audience members dashing for the exits. Just stay five more minutes. When I worked at the Met, I remember Hildegard Behrens was singing Isolde. And I went into the auditorium in the back to hear the Liebestod. And in the middle of the fifth row, 
I saw a woman stand up with Mildun lies and suddenly going out of the row with her bags, coming up the aisle. And when she came to the door, I said, Madam, you walked out at the climactic moment. Couldn't you wait five more minutes? She said, I have the 1124 train to Scarsdale. If I miss it, I have another hour. <laughs> I know. Well, then take another hour, go have a drink and take the next train. <laughs> I mean, I know that's often the reason, either a train or getting out of the parking garage before everybody else uh, gets out. But it's, um, you know, you make the effort to come to the performance, you come all the way, you buy the ticket, mentalize the time also to get out and not within three minutes, but maybe it'll take you 25, but build this into your thinking for the evening so that you truly enjoy what you paid for and truly enjoy the, the entire arch of the performance, including the applause, which to me sometimes yeah. is sometimes that I feel is necessary at the end of the performance to be able to express your enthusiasm. Certainly Tristan and Isolde. Oh, yeah. um, Another recording you picked, um, I said that one of my favorite operas is Andreas Chenier. My probable desert island opera, if I really only had to go away with one, would be Verdi's Don Carlo mm -hmm. in all of its different versions. Same and here. So obviously I know the one that you picked conducted by Carlo Maria Giulini at Covent Garden in the late 1950s with John Vickers, and I don't know how to pronounce your name, Gray Bovenstein the wonderful mezzo Fedora Barbieri, my teacher, Tito Gobi, Boris Kristoff, rather magnificent at the Royal Opera House in 1958. When I went back to listen to it though, I forgot something. It was a live performance. Yeah. And in the recording, you hear the British audience in 1958. And that certainly added something to my experience because Don Carlo the Opera has these wonderful musical set pieces. You just want to cheer at the end of certain scenes, and the audience did cheer. When you picked yeah. this recording, was it in part the audience presence or really the musical performances? I just, A, it's a phenomenal cast, which of course, that's a cast I never saw live. I'm a bit, I'm a bit too young for that. Um, I love Rudini especially the younger Giulini in, in this recording. And, and I love Don Carlo. I confess Don Carlo was my very first opera. Hmm. Uh, I was 16. I had a student ticket that evening, uh, fifth row in this uh, really rather impressive uh, Ponell production in Hamburg. And it was um, Leonucci, Luis Lima, Raimondi, Zampieri, Molinari Pradelli conducting. I mean, it was, I don't know from Adam who they were, but I just sat there and went, wow. I mean, plus in the fifth row in the orchestra, if that doesn't sure. kind of blow you away, nothing will blow you away. Yeah. And, and I just, I really enjoyed it. And then my second opera was Luisa Miller, uh, but a month later with, um, with Domingo Nucci, Moldoviano and Sinopoli conducting. So not bad either. Um, but Don Carlo is, is just such a complex piece in all its versions, as you say. I like it in all its versions. And it has so much to offer. And Verdi, I think, in this opera showed incredible genius uh, in, in the way he portrayed musically every single character and the way he told us how he sees every single character of the opera uh, in the opera. And I, I just love it. I love the energy. I love the beauty. I like, I love the warmth in, in it. And, uh, and, you know, it's also a piece that if you're really interested, it can stimulate you in many directions. Historically, uh, Schiller, if you want to go into the literature um, of, and the background of it, Verdi himself. I mean, there's so much if you want to spend Velasquez, time. Velasquez, when I teach Velasquez. that opera, I use the yeah. imagery from the uh, Prado Museum in Madrid. Yeah. of some of these so, people. So if you want to go deeper, Don Carlo offers so much of true history, of fiction, of, of invented history. And, and it, 
it's just amazing. To me, it's just a wonderful piece of complex, a complex piece of art. And the soprano character, Elisabetta Elizabeth in, in the French version, um, is to me one of the most undervalued of all characters in opera. I think that her aria, Tu che le vanità, late in the opera is the Italian Liebestod in a way. It sums everything. And I've heard many of the great artists sing it. Uh, I also, I spend a lot of time teaching about Italy and art history, and I'm doing a, for people who want, on uh, October 4th at 2 p.m. California time, 5 p.m. in New York, and you can find it in your own home. At the Getty Museum, I'm doing a talk on Michelangelo and his connection to food and wine. And I was researching about Catherine de' Medici who brought, oh, she was Italian, but brought a lot of French products to Italy in Michelangelo's time and after. What I didn't know about Catherine de' Medici, her daughter was Elizabeth, as in Elizabeth de, de Valois, the Elizabeth of Verdi's opera in Don Carlo. That I had no idea about. Oh, wow. You, that was that, kind of a, I, that connection I was not aware of either. Wow. Nor was I. It was kind of stunning to me. But anyway, back to um, your selections. You specifically picked what we call the garden scene in Don Carlo, where we have Eboli who loves Carlo, it's very complicated, and Posa, the baritone, who is devoted to the cause of Flanders, but also helping Carlo. And Eboli is a schemer, let's put it that way, but the best schemer of all. Um, yeah. And she arrives in a veil, and Carlo thinks he's meeting Elizabeth. And the one joke, let's call it, in all of that opera is the moment when Carlo thinks it's Elizabeth and she reveals the veil and suddenly he sort of lurches back in horror. Uh, oops. <laughs> <laughs> it's the equivalent in Siegfried in the ring of uh, where Siegfried looks at Brunhilde and says, das ist kein Mann. <laughs> <And> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, this, it's uh, similar. <laughs> I would agree with you. Why this particular scene? Because I, it, it has the, the, the poetry, the, the, the beauty at the very beginning, those first phrases of Don Carlo when he comes in, a mezzanotte nel giardino della regina sotto la fonte vicina. This is, and then the following lines that he sings, it's so beautiful. I mean, he expects to see somebody he truly loves and the music reflects that. But you go from that to this, interaction with Eboli when before he figures out that it's not her and then you it and it spans all the art of dramatic temperament when one of my favorite moments there is when when Eboli turns around and goes Trema per te, falso figlio. I think it's it just this whole scene has it all and I mean, if I if I were able to sing, I would love to sing Eboli. This is the role I think is just so uh, powerful and has so much temperament and beauty also. Uh, but this scene from the entrance of Don, uh, of Don Carlo to the end of the scene, he has every emotional and, and, and facet that Don Carlo as an opera as a whole has to offer. It's a wonderful phrase you just used, if I were able to sing. Because, you know, many of us who work in opera come from backgrounds where we sang a bit when we were younger yeah. or we were trained and perhaps we either realized we didn't quite have what it takes to be Fedora Barbieri or John Vickers or whoever. But it's a wonderful game that a lot of us play. If I were able to sing, this is what I would sing. For me, it would be two roles. It would be Andrea Chenier and it would be Tannhäuser. It would be my two. Wow. Yeah. That's that's strong. That's Yeah, it is strong. Yeah. But especially because I'm not a tenor. So that would be incredibly hard to do. Um, but you picked another wonderful piece of music that no one has mentioned yet that I love. The Brahms Alto Rhapsody. Um, conducted by Claudio Botto, who... I 
knew, I loved, I worked with him a lot. And I can't pronounce her name, Mariana Lipov, Lipov Marina Lipovshek. Lipov she was in the ensemble in Hamburg. When I started going to the opera, Marina Lipovshek was in the ensemble in, in Hamburg. Little, uh, you know, before she had, uh, she, she started and then went on to have a fantastic career. And I always loved that voice, that dark, smooth, velvety sound. Uh, it's a voice I always enjoyed a lot. And I heard, I was lucky enough to hear her a lot in Hamburg where she sang everything uh, and, and frequently. And I really enjoy that recording. I mean, A, Abado, but also Lipovshek's just um, phrasing and color and, and roundness of her sound, I think fits that piece so beautifully. And uh, I, I really enjoy that, that piece a lot. I mean, it's a short, it's not performed very often and maybe a little bit overlooked, but uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's wonderful and, and touching. Um, based on a, a using a Goethe text. And I, I just really think it's a little jewel that should be enjoyed a bit more often than it is. Am I correct? Do I associate Brahms with Hamburg? Was he from? Oh there? yeah, Brahms was yeah. born in Hamburg. Okay, Brahms cause... was born in Hamburg. And uh, of course, you know, the, the, the Hamburg Hanseatic merchant mentality didn't give him the proper attention and so he he moved on uh, and uh, was then a lot uh, supported and helped by by Karl Schumann and then ended up in Vienna, but uh, but yes he was from Hamburg his his uh, house where he was born is close to the Musikhalle pretty much between the opera house and the Musikhalle uh, in the center of Hamburg, and and I love Brahms and not really not because he's from Hamburg I don't suffer of that need to love what comes from my city, but I, yeah. I, I really love Brahms's warmth, that humanity that speaks out of most of his music and especially in the Alto Rhapsody, but also in the Brahms Requiem and in his symphonies. The, the, the harmonies of his music are just warm and of human affection, I think. Mm -hmm. um you say so many of the things you say trigger thoughts in me, which I greatly appreciate. I like that kind of conversation. One was that if we grow up hearing particular voices, they become our touchstones for what a mezzo should sound like, what an alto, what a tenor, and so on. And you had Mariana Lipovchek. I had Tatiana Troianos who was the voice of the mezzo repertory at the Met when I first came back to New York and worked at the Met. She was really the one singing everything, Giulietta, Mozart, uh, Sesto, uh, Dora Bella, uh, Venus, Eboli, Carmen, you name it. Yeah. And I just remembered she actually sang in Hamburg a lot. Did you ever get to hear her yes. there? No, no, there was. She sang a lot, I believe, when uh, Liebermann was there in the in the sixties. So the first, because Liebermann came back in the in the eighties at some 80s, point, yeah. but it was the that during this first period uh, that she sang that Liebermann brought her a lot. As far as I know, again, I was right. born in sixty five, so okay. <laughs> so I'm getting it. When you went to your first opera, Don Carlo, at sixteen. Okay, I have the time frame. Um, so. Let's talk about the company you are at now. We should first mention briefly Washington National Opera as a part of your life. Tell us about that. Uh, what well, was San Francisco Opera and then Washington Opera? Um, I love being in Washington. I mean, it was it's a fascinating city. I'm glad I was there when I was there, and uh, it's it. It was 11 years. I mean, that was a long time. It was seven years at San Francisco. And I, I enjoyed Washington a lot. I mean, we did a lot of fabulous productions. We, uh, the Young Artist Program there was uh, really produced a lot of excellent singers. I mean, a lot of the singers from Placidos Operalia uh, then also came, came to the Young Artist Program. But the, 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 the audition process was very rigorous in order mm -hmm. to get in there. 
and the ambitions for quality because they had to sing they had to be able to sing in our productions also and the it it was a great time it, we worked extremely hard because it wasn't really a huge staff like you know most american opera companies were right. not exactly generously staffed and so it was a lot of hard work um i had great collaborators and great assistants that went on for excellent careers uh, themselves david levy and scott gazilek went on and have great positions in the business and uh we we had fun, but we worked hard. And I um, I have to say that there were a lot of very memorable productions over those years. Although I have to tell you, I couldn't point one out that said this was my favorite. There was so much activity and so much work and so much uh, interesting. It was a really interesting life that I had there. So everything was just fireworks and constant new uh, productions and new events. It was just a wonderful time. So was San Francisco, to be honest. I mean, I work yeah. with Latvi Mansuri in San Francisco, which uh, Latvi was extremely demanding. And that was that was uh, very challenging. I was 28 at the time when I, uh, when I became artistic administrator there and Sarah Billinghurst had left for the Met. Mm -hmm. Those were huge shoes to get into. Luckily, yeah. I wasn't entirely aware of it because otherwise I would have been, I probably I would have been running away in panic. <laughs> and uh, so I, sometimes ignorance is bliss. And uh, it was seven years that were fascinating to work there. So I'm trying to remember the time frame, but one of my most memorable performances I saw in Washington was Morella Franey's farewell to opera, which did not happen in New York or Milan. It happened in Washington with Tchaikovsky's Joan of Arc. Actually, the picture, the, I had to, the picture I took off earlier because yeah. it, was, it was reflecting. Okay. That's a sketch. Ah. From that made of Orleans. That was so, Mirella's last stage production indeed. And you were there at the time. Yeah. I know you and I met when you were at Washington Opera, but I don't quite recall the, the dates, but it was when you were in Me Washington. Either. But Franey was one of my very, very favorites. Uh, she's the first star soprano I ever worked with. I was very young and she was everything I'd want to work with. And so I made a point of going to Washington for the Maid of Orleans. And frankly, what struck me was I found the audience, maybe they didn't know they were in the presence of history there, but they were acknowledging of a fine performance by a famous singer. But had it been the Met or La Scala or Vienna or Salzburg or London or certainly Barcelona, the response would have been different. And yeah. that struck no, me. No, you're very, right. Yeah. You have to take into account that, you know, history in Washington happens a couple of miles further over where, you know, the, we have the White House and the Capitol in Washington, D.C. And so that's where the the truly important history in that city happens. And uh, no, I don't think the audience was fully aware what they were witnessing yeah. as far as operatic history is concerned. But uh, it sure was, I mean, it was very enthusiastic and appreciative for the wonderful performance that they got. And uh, for Mirella, I mean, Mirella was very happy with those performances. I mean, on yeah. the other hand, yes, she didn't get maybe the massive enthusiasm she would have gotten at La Scala or, or at, the, at the Met, but it also was, was, you know, quiet. It was calm. There was no there was no discussion and more polemic. It was beautifully received. Mm -hmm. And I think for her last uh, stage production, that probably was, was a wonderful feeling. Um, even if in a different place, you could have had more explosive reaction. You're right. So now let's go to Seattle where you are at the moment. Yep. Um, when I posted in my social media that I was going to be conversing with you, so many nice messages came in about you. And I, I have to be blunt, 
not every person I interview do I get that kind of <laughs> communication. <laughs> You know, I, I appreciate the positive <laughs> comments, but I, I shouldn't try to please everybody. It's that no. because if you do this, you're not going to please anybody at the end. So I, I'm very grateful for those reactions uh, that that uh, that came to you. And, you know, I remember when I heard that you were moving to Seattle to the number one position, thinking, well, great for Seattle, and it sounds <laughs> great for Christina, but wow. Barcelona, leaving Barcelona and everything we've discussed about that. Um, Seattle, nonetheless, it's a wonderful city that does have a very well-regarded opera company that I view as very particular. I'll say a little about it, but then I'd love to know your views about it. It was founded in 1963 by a man named Glenn Ross, uh, with whom I worked a fair amount, not in Seattle, but in Arizona. Because when, oh, he I see. Left yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ari when he left Seattle, he helped found the Arizona Opera in two yeah. cities, in Phoenix and Tucson. Mm -hmm. And he loved Wagner for reasons we'll get into. And part of my job was to help him get his first ring up and going in Arizona. And it was yeah. my idea that it be done in outdoor spaces because so much of the ring is environmental and about plateaus and vistas and forests and oh, yeah. hell and everything in Valhalla. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting, even if we had to use microphones, to do an outdoor ring in different settings? And that was part of my job there. And he was tough, but he was he knew what he wanted. And, and to create an opera company or an opera building or anything anywhere is a huge challenge. And he was followed by Spate Jenkins, who was there for many, many years. And Spate, if my memory serves, began as a lawyer. I knew him as a writer, as a commentator yeah. about opera. And I was not displeased, but I was a little surprised to learn that the people in Seattle had the wisdom to take Spate Jenkins, despite his not having much opera administrative background. And Seattle Opera, among the many things it's famous for, is its Wagner link. And there are, Wagner lovers know this, Wagner cities in the world. In Italy, it's Bologna. In Spain, it's yeah. Barcelona. In the United States, the Met aside, it has to be Seattle. It, it's Seattle historically. I mean, historically. in the last years, it has not been that simply, I mean, also because as everybody knows, doing the ring or doing Wagner is a monumental financial uh, effort also. So in the last years, it's been not possible, but that doesn't mean that one cannot do it again. It's just a little patience, I'd say. Um, I, I don't subscribe to bankrupting a company just to insist to, to do a ring. Uh, so let's do it when it's right. But no, you're right. I mean, even the, I mean, Spade has done several ring, several ring cycles, several productions. Uh, I saw two productions here. I came here in '95. I, I mean, oh God, I don't remember what as the years, but I saw two ring, different ring cycles here, and the audience was amazing. I mean, and there is uh, there's a lot of audience here that remembers those rings, those ring cycles that would love to have it back. That uh, that are very enthusiastic and dedicated. To Wagner, and that of course started with Glenn Ross. I mean, there's no no question. And uh, and Spade continued that tradition. Spade was here 31, 32 years. Mm -hmm. He still lives here. I just saw him on Tuesday. Uh, we had him here for a, a talk for the for King FM Radio, and uh, he he was amazing. I mean, he, yes, he was a critic, uh, not an opera administrator when he came here, but you know, think there are many things you can learn as you do it. Uh, but he was an excellent critic and an excellent connoisseur of of voices and of the operatic <clears throat> repertoire and of music in general. And he he left a big mark here. There's no question. And I'm very. I met him in '94 when I came first to Seattle. <clears throat> and over the years, he has been a a, a wonderful colleague. Also, I mean, I'm. I'm much younger than he is. When I came here, I was way young. And 
no matter what, I always got an incredible courtesy and, and professional respect, even when I was by far his junior and also a junior in, in the business at the time. And I, mm-hmm. I've always appreciated that, that respect that he, that, uh, that he gave me. And, and, he, I, he, and I have immense respect for him. So it's nice to see him once in a while. We do either have coffee or lunch here. And he, he, um, he doesn't come too often to the opera, but, uh, but he's here and he knows exactly what's going on. And uh, he's been a beautiful support also and has always said, whatever you need, let me know. So I'm, I'm very happy that he's still here. And I also brought him to the, to the office once because we have a lot of young staff at Seattle Opera right now and they had never met the man. And I said, no, this can't be. He's here. He lives here. So I had him come in one day and um, he spent time talking about his experience here. And I thought it was important, but also beautiful for present staff members to meet somebody who um, means so much to this company. So it was, it was good. And I'm, and I'm really happy as he's, he is here. Seattle for people listening from elsewhere who don't know it is a very particular place. And I don't say that as a euphemism. It's just, it's unmistakable to other places. Um, it is a place that Native Americans created thousands of years ago. It has an ancient yes. history. Uh, the area was famous especially for its forests, but also fisheries and fur animals and so on. And it's the gateway to Alaska. And it's a series of islands and a huge port. And it is very northerly. I looked something up yesterday. It's the same latitude as Salzburg and correct. further north yes. than Toronto or Montreal. Surprise. That is correct. But it's not as, uh, not as far north as Hamburg. I always thought they were more ah. or less the same because yeah. Seattle to me in its scent feels a little bit like Hamburg. It has You're this right. the water, the sea scent, the salty air. It does. And it's a really beautiful city. And you're right, it's that uh, has all the islands in front. You don't have direct access to the Pacific Ocean, uh, but it's surrounded by water, by lakes, by, by bay that then ends up in the, in the Pacific. It's still, it's, it's full of forests and mountains. And uh, yeah. uh, I've, I love the expression when, when you can see Mount Rainier, that clear days when Mount Rainier is just right there and it feels like it's in your face. And the Seattle, I'd say the mountain is out. And I love that expression because it really is out. It, it feels like it's in your face and it's about 120 miles um, south of Seattle. It's, but it's uh, also, yeah, it's also famous city. for worldwide brands such as Boeing and Microsoft and Amazon and Starbucks. Starbucks, Oculus. And, uh, yes. There are and many. Yeah, it punches above its weight in that regard. If you compare it, say, to Philadelphia, which is a magnificent city that I love, but Philadelphia doesn't have the kind of Fortune 500 companies, international brands. And I think you can see where I'm leading, that Philadelphia, with its wonderful orchestra and opera company and music conservatories, it's difficult to raise money when you don't have corporate support there. It's difficult to raise money here, too. It's not automatic. Uh, and also, I th- but generally in the U.S., that there is a genera- generational issue that there's a generation before that that gave more to its community. I mean, that that, that sense of responsibility for the community and giving back and giving culture back and giving cultural institutions is um, it still exists. I, I mean, please, I, I, it absolutely still exists. But it has changed a little bit. So we, what we are trying now in our relationships with these big companies and with the um, with the population that could give and is affluent is really making connections to 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 give sense to why am I giving? Just because I have the money to give doesn't mean I I should give. And so giving really a connection that uh, 
that gives a rationale to why do I give? And I do think that the why has to do one with education. I have to go back that arts and music education makes better professionals later, even if you don't sing or if you don't play an instrument, but the thinking process that is behind art, the creativity, the flexibility of mind, the math that music offers. I mean, it, it, it all has a purpose also in your formation. So I do think there's a very good reason to give to the arts. But also if you want to attract people to your city um, to work here, to move here, you have to offer something. And the, the, a city, an international city uh, should have everything, you know, from rock, pop, jazz museums, uh, science fairs, uh, Renaissance fairs, museums, ballet, music, opera, a symphony orchestra. I think a, a great city needs a, a variety of great institutions at a high level. And you should help to have some pride and really make sure that the city has these institutions that operate at a high quality level. Because those companies you just mentioned and many others that are here too that you didn't mention, they expect high quality. Those are companies that are great and wealthy companies because they have created immense quality in their way they function, in their operation, in their vision, and in their technology. So that perfection in, in their own world, I think should be expected also by what the community has to offer. I also happen to be an admirer of the mayor of Seattle, Jenny Durkin, and especially the governor of Washington State, Jay Inslee, who um, I was interested in his becoming president because he is a future looking person. He understands more than any American politician, even Al Gore, the importance of environmental protection and planning for the future. And I see that reflected so often in policies for Washington state, including uh, Seattle. Uh, there was a nuclear reactor a number of years ago in, in the Eastern part of Washington state, I believe it was called Hanford that um, exploded and caused damage. And I went to visit there a few years ago and it's turned into sort of a natural habitat because people can't live there but you can go sailing through and yeah. animals have returned and it looks like wild nature of the West uh, with these wolves and other animals that couldn't be there because man had interceded. And Washington state is in many ways a leader in terms of agriculture and organics and so on. And so much of that comes from the good politicians, from good senators, uh, from the University of Washington, which is a real leader also in its medical school. And I, you live in a wonderful place. Oh, it's a fantastic place. And yeah. I think that the awareness um, of the, as far as the environment is concerned, has to do with what this state represents. Historically, as far as the Native American tribes are concerned that, that always had an, an immense concern and respect for the world they lived in. And I think it still transcends to into today. But also we have uh, lots of agriculture, wine business, uh, wine, wine um, cultivation. And you know, you don't, and also Seattle, you don't have to go far. You're out in nature very, very quickly. And and the the intent to preserve this is uh, is very important to to this state and to this region and <laughs> i i mean this is something that i had to laugh a lot last fall a colleague of mine to tell you well, how nature really influences us also even when when in the very surprising wells a colleague of mine texted me one morning and says i'm coming late because he lives on an island he has to take the ferry I said, the ferries are delayed. There's orca traffic in the bay. Uh, whales. I mean, <laughs> where do you have that? I mean, it's just, it, it made me laugh, but it also made me smile a lot because I think that's really beautiful that, 
that whale traffic will stop the ferry because everything yields to them. And sometimes I think it's very important to yield to nature and not think that we can just trample it all down or out of our way. That's a good point to conclude on. It's not that I plan to, but that is such an eloquent and all-encompassing statement that I don't know if I want to go past it, but is there anything that I left out that maybe you want to talk about? I think you covered a lot and I and thank you for, for going the whole range. I think it was, I, I enjoyed talking about all of this. If you really keep going, we'll talk for another hour and a half and then our listeners will be, uh, will get bored. And no, we'll, no, we'll, no, no, <laughs> we can yeah, do no, this no, again. You, know, <laughs> you always want to stop you always want to stop and hopefully people still want more. So Leave them wanting more. Uh, yes. The only quibble I have is, I'm sorry, but Washington State apples compared to New York State apples, New York is really, it's called the big apple, but in part because we have an apple culture here that is among the most elevated in the world. England has it a little bit. The state of Virginia has it, but Washington apples are fine no problem. But when you have a real New York State apple and all of its complexity and each apple has a season of about two or three weeks and different textures and sweetnesses and tartness mm -hmm. and so on, no other place has that. So well, I don't have a problem with you preferring New York apples because I prefer the Hamburg apples. South of Hamburg is one of the largest, uh, you know, kind of connected area of apple growing plums, cherries in, in Germany. And it's south, I know it. it's south of Hamburg. Frankfurt has apple wine. Yes. That is, uh, it is what it is. It's okay. But um, nonetheless, you have enriched us. You know, we say an apple a day keeps the doctor <laughs> away. A conversation with Christina Skeppelbun makes us all better. <laughs> Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Fred. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thanks, See everybody, for listening. Okay. I'll be the same. Bye-bye.